There are two short lyrical poems. Both are translations from the languages which are used in the northeastern part of India. The first poem that we are going to examine or study is entitled Curse. It is by a poet called Kapita Sinha. There are a few observations given by the editors regarding the poet about the writer. Kavita Sinha was born in the year 1931 and she died in 1999. Regarding her contribution to language and literature, it says that she was a poet, a novelist, and uh, in addition to being a uh, poet and novelist, uh, we can see uh, when, uh, that there was a feminist sensibility in her writing. And we are equally informed by the editors that she was also the director of the radio. She is noted for her modern, modernist stance, rejecting the traditional housebound role for the Bengali women. A theme echoed later in the work of other poets, including Mandita Sen Gupta and Taslima Nasreen. Uh, she also published a novel called Parush, which talks about the life of the eunuchs and which also got an award in the year 1986. And she has, till date, when the text was edited, uh, we are informed that she has published about 50 books uh, under various names, not only Kavita Sinha but also another name, pen name called Sultana Chaudhary. So that's about the writer. Now, reading about the biography details, we realize that the version of the poem that we are going to read is a translated version. The poem has been translated into English by two people called Inachi Chatterjee and Caroline Wright. The poem is called The Curse, which gives rise to the question of who curses whom. Curse is uttered by somebody to somebody else. It is always negative. The question arises, who curses who? A close reading of the poem reveals that it is the curse is uttered by or it, it happens from nature to human beings. Why does, then we start wondering, why does nature curse human beings? The reason is human beings have become greedy, materialistic and acquisitive. There is nothing wrong in acquiring materialism. Up to some extent we need some material base in order to lead a life, a smooth and meaningful life in this world. We need something some support on the material plane. However, human beings, once they are given stability and uh, what we call security in life, they want to acquire more and more. And this acquisitive habit of human beings has led to a lot of I mean, uh, damage. In that process, they have done a lot of damage to nature. What is the damage to nature? Even things that they don't want, I mean they don't need to possess, they want to have it just because they fancy having it. So, lot of the nature is exploited and uh, there is lot of cutting down the trees and forests, animals are killed, etc. So that is a curse. So in turn, nature curses human beings for destroying it. So that is the focus of the poem. So to read the poem. First by Kavita Sinha. Look now, the entire forest has gone dead as wood in this room. In the polished four-poster bed, in the nocturnal chair, you are sitting on a tree's too, and on a 
table, the stony eyed potato is a dead bird hunched on a dead branch, and you are absorbing the person's daily. Because you alone have thrashed a whole forest to death. This chunk of wood once gave forth living flowers inside the millet solid buds. Thick, continuous life poured out. Your fancy bedstead won't be decked with flowers now. The pillow is stuffed, the, sorry, the pillow's the cotton stuffing anchors for revenge. It will throw its damning silken carpets into your dreams. The disembodied forest will breathe into you, and among all this wood, you will be surely turned to. The life force will drain out of your five senses. So that is the poem. It's a long, I mean, short little poem. It is directly addressed to the in the reader. See, when we talk about the viewpoint, there are three viewpoints. The first person viewpoint, then the second person viewpoint, and the third person omniscient viewpoint. Here, the poet has deliberately selected the second person pronoun. The advantage of employing this kind of a when the viewpoint is the direct I mean, it directly addresses the reader, it involves the reader in, into the issue that the writer is going to present. Throughout the poem, we realize that the poet is, I mean, he or she uses the, I mean, the present tense. The speaker uses the present tense to create an immediacy of the effect that uh, that has happened to nature. That is why the very opening lines, the or the opening expression is very very significant. Look now, that's how the poem opens. Look now is drawing attention in the present uh, regarding the present condition regarding the forest. Look now is a direct address to the reader. The entire forest has gone dead as wood in this room. There is a comparison. The comparison is the forest which was a living entity has been destroyed and it has been converted. It is not totally gone rather than it has been converted into a different thing. Instead of a living plant or a tree which produces flowers, fruit and which provides shelter to so many beings, it has been reduced to furniture. So that's why in the very opening lines draws the reader's, reader's attention and invites him to view the kind of destruction that man has done to nature. Look now, the entire forest has gone dead, has put in this room. So that means the poet is using a comparison. The comparison is the you by using the figure of speech and the simile. So on the one hand you have the living forest and the living forest is contrasted with dead wood, something which does not move, something which does not have any kind of life. Then the poet continues to draw the attention of the reader. Either it is a poet or we can also say that it might be some imaginary speaker who is sensitive towards nature. In that polished four poster bed, in that nocturnal chair, you are sitting on a tree's too. Now she gives specific examples of how the dead wood has been converted or how the living tree has been converted into dead wood and how the dead wood is further converted into furniture. She refers to the cot which has four legs. So that's what she talks about in the polished four poster bed. Four poster is something which stands on the pillars, small pillar kind of structures which uh, hold the 
bed together. So a four poster bed. Then she also refers to the chair. In the nocturnal chair, you are sitting on a tree stool, and she considers since the tree is dead, the living tree is converted. So she talks about the chair and uh, the other kind of furniture, which is chair and uh, and the pot, which is created out of it. As a two of the tree, you are sitting. You again look at the use of the second the second person pronoun. You as if she is making an allegation. You are sitting on a tree stool and on the table. Then she draws attention to another furniture in the room, that is the table. And what 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 does the reader see? The stony eyed cockatoo is a bird. I'm sorry, is a dead bird hunched on a dead branch. So in order to create a pleasant atmosphere for himself, the man not only had a number of furniture, which is actually uh, a, a conversion of a living tree into dead wood, but also the reference to a bird, a cacato bird is a kind of parrot. And the stony eye, that is a very important detail, because stony indicates no movement, as in like a stone, as in there is no movement in it. So equally the bird is dead. In the beginning we get to know, see before we read the next line, we get to know that the, uh, the person who I mean, uh, wanted to have a pleasant uh, setting or surroundings in his room had equally had a favorite, I mean uh, what we call uh, a pet parrot in his room. But actually then the very detailed stony eye clearly indicates that it is not a living bird rather than it's equally a stuffed bird. He is a dead bird hunched on a dead branch. See, the bird is made as if uh, when it is sitting on a branch of a tree and equally the, both the I mean, uh, branch as well as the bird, they are equally dead. So that is the damage that man has done to nature. And you are absorbing the person's daily is the conclusion that the when, um, speaker arrives at. Since you have damaged so much, continuously it seems as if, in spite of the objects being dead, they are occurring, they continue to live in a different form, and uh, they are, it seems as if they are cursing the person. They, and in that way, the living person, the person who lives in the room without being aware of the fact of the damage that he has done. He is absorbing the curses. He is taking the curses on a day-to-day -day basis. Daily, he says. Then, there is a, she comes to a conclusion. What is the reason for all these things? Why, why the man is supposed to absorb the curses? It is explicitly stated or obviously stated. What is it? Because and the reason. You alone have thrashed the whole forest to death. See, it is only man, no other creature does any kind of damage to nature. They, want, they take whatever is necessary for the time being and then they don't damage anything further. But here, man is very, very inquisitive. Not only he tries to fulfill uh, whatever he, I mean, uh, necessities are there in the present, he also tries to take something more for the future. So in that way, man has become very, very aggressive and inquisitive towards nature. So that is the way that he has treated nature. That is the way that he has exploited nature. Because you alone, clearly indicating or implicating the entire humanity, you alone have thrashed the whole forest to death. Then the next few lines talk about the beauty of nature. The contrast. There is a contrast to what has gone earlier. So the first few lines, it's a very, very disturbing uh, picture of nature. And then the next few lines bring out the beauty of nature. This chunk of wood once gave forth living flowers. See, it was throbbing with life. And uh, full of what we call uh, the sap of the tree and bubbling, when, uh, when, uh, putting forth all the flowers. All these things made, uh, makes nature very, very 
attractive. Once upon a time, before it was cut down, the tree was full of vitality and zest. It gave forth living flowers. Inside the mirrored solid birds, thick continuous life poured out. See, that refers to the sap that flows into the branches as in the flowers. Equally, the, the sap poured, uh, flowed not only in the branches but equally it collected in the flowers. Remember the insects as well as birds feed on it. So that's how uh, nature gets connected. So inside the mirrored solid birds, thick continuous life poured out. All these things are destroyed by man. You fancy that state won't be dead with flowers now. So, for having destroyed nature, what man is going to experience in the future? It's not a long time they have to wait, rather than in the near future he is going to suffer for, the, for his actions. So, what, how, how does it happen according to the speaker? You fancy that state won't be dead with flowers now. See, the kind of imagination that he had wanted to have his bed, bedstead decorated with the flower designs that cannot happen because there is no I mean the flower which the artist can copy and imprint it, imprint it on the bedstead so it cannot happen now the pillows cotton stuffing handcuffs for the range not only the bedstead but equally the pillow also cannot uh, then uh, provide the person rest and happiness because when do we I mean like I mean uh, what do we do with the pillow we lie down we want rest and our, we want our body to relax and our mind to go to rest but it cannot happen because the kind of action that man has done is going to come back it's going to boomerang on him. Because it's not good action, rather than he was very very inquisitive and now with the kind of damage that he has done, he has accumulated so much of sin and I mean the entire nature is cursing him. So he will not, he, the crime continues to haunt him in his imagination. So he does not get the peace that he longs for. The pillows, cotton stuffing, the pillows are stuffed with cotton. And again, it is a product of nature. And uh, he wants to rest on it, but he doesn't get it. Handcuffs for revenge, equally the cotton is waiting to take revenge on man. It will throw its damning silicon cobwebs into your dreams. See, man expects to get sleep and peace of mind, but instead of uh, when, uh, peace of mind, what, I mean, what he sees is he sees nightmares. He dreams because he continues to, that the nature continues to haunt his imagination so he doesn't get sleep. The disembodied forest will breathe into you and among all this wood you will be slowly turned to. So the for entire forest is disembodied, that means the living tree is I mean, cut down and it is totally dissolved and it has been converted into various uh, when, uh, furniture and that disim the forest continues to live in a disembodied form and continues to haunt human beings for the crimes that they have done against nature. The disembodied forest will breathe into you, but what, what does it breathe? It does not breathe any kind of well being rather than it, it breathes poison because it wants to pay revenge on human beings. And what is the effect of all these things? And among all this wood, you will be slowly turned to wood. So for ultimately, man also loses all the vitality and whatever crimes that he has done to nature, it, it comes back to him. So slowly man will also become like dead wood, slowly turned to wood. And the last line talks about, I mean, the rounds of the argument. The life force will drain out of your five senses. So five, I mean, life which is a composition of the co-mingling of the five, I mean, elements and the senses. And finally, man, man loses control over his senses. And finally, I mean, um, he also turns into dead, dead wood, like the tree that 
he created in the beginning. So with these observations, the poem concludes.